Okay, this is an interesting one. Remember with EG, we had two words abbreviated. But with et al, notice that it's short for et altera, which means and others. But notice that only the al is abbreviated. So there is no period after the et. It means and. Okay? But when we're speaking about the other authors of a paper. Yes. Uh, it can be interpreted both ways, as the main author and some And others. Or the most uh, politically correct way to interpret is that so Regardless, the format is never this. It's rarely this, except in very bare bones formats for some journals. <laughs> it is almost always ET space AL period. Okay? Number three, due to is kind of an ugly construction that really can be replaced by owing to. Here's another interesting one. Um, in the old days, when there were typesetters who were going to retype your manuscript, uh, it was common and usually required that there be two spaces after periods at the end of sentences and after colons. That is no longer necessary because our word processing programs are smart enough to put a little extra space after the end of a sentence or after a colon. Um, so that is not necessary, but at the very least, be absolutely painfully consistent. That's the biggest lesson in all of this. If you're going to have two, two spaces after a period here, do it everywhere. Okay? Now, British versus US spelling, given my nation of origin, I have to say that the US spelling is correct. But I'm quite willing to accept the existence of British spelling. What I'm not willing to accept is mixtures of the two systems. So some of the journals require British spelling, so be absolutely consistent throughout your manuscript about using the British spelling. Other journals, perhaps the majority, require American spelling, and so be absolutely consistent about American spelling throughout. Um, hyphenated um, compound modifiers. So it's essentially when you're using a compound modifier, like well-respected, as an adjective, um, better to join the two modifiers with a hyphen. Last one, um, where refers only to position. Predate does not mean to eat. Um, this is a systematics one, a monophyletic clade. A clade is monophyletic by de definition. Data, contrary to popular opinion, data is plural. The word data is plural, I should say. Um, one of my favorite things to edit out is the, vastly overused. Then, one of the things I truly hate, but actually is apparently accepted now, under some systems of grammar, are split infinitives. So, to blatantly divide. I consider it wrong. If the system you are working under does not consider it wrong, we should at least acknowledge that it is ugly. And then last um, is the, system, the difference between hyphens and dashes. And in fact, there are three. A hyphen connects pieces of words, compound words. So like n dash, 
that's a hyphen. <laughs> N dashes, which is this slightly longer thing, are used to indicate ranges or intervals. And then M dashes, which are still longer, are used essentially to set aside parts of sentences. So those are some little tiny details. I personally think they make quite a difference in making your language attractive and flow well. OK. So now we're kind of to the point where we start to wrap up our manuscript. Um, one thing that we have to deal with is the citations. And you've all heard the phrase that science builds on, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And in many senses, that's true. You know, what we're doing could not have happened, at the very least, without Linnaeus, probably without Darwin and, and Wallace as well, and a century and a half of additional input by lots of scientists. So when you publish your work, you should acknowledge all of the precursors and inputs. You don't have to go back to Linnaeus and you know, cite Linnaeus 1789 for providing the taxonomic system that you're using. But you really should cite everything that is more immediately relevant to your work. So the most important thing is to cite other studies to place your work in the context of work already done. You should generally cite, uh, you should generally avoid citing yourself over much. Now, if you have published two other chapters of your dissertation, and this is the third chapter on the same subject, same data, you should definitely cite those previous chapters um, so that people can link the different pieces of your dissertation and search out those <coughs> other papers. But if you're citing something general, you know, biodiversity is concentrated in the tropics, don't cite yourself. Cite some review paper or some landmark publication because it's really seen poorly. Cite other people's work broadly and fairly. You should cover what is out there in the literature. You should not play favorites or you know, try to lend a hand to your colleagues by citing them up. And if you have to have enemies, it's not a good idea. But if you have to have enemies, you know, follow the, the rule of cite thy enemy. As positively as you can. Keep your friends close. And, and your enemies face. closer. <laughs> so citations are not rewards or symbols of friendship or alliance. OK? So um, this has gotten to be so um, ugly a situation that now I've even seen situations where if you're publishing in a rather dubious journal occasionally you'll get a message from the editor saying we very much like your work um, we feel that it's suitable for publication in our journal but we refrain from a final acceptance because we feel it's missing some literature. If you review the past year of publication by our journal, you'll see uh, several relevant papers, and we would urge you to cite them, add citations to your work of those papers, and return to us your final revision. Translation. Impact factors depend on citation rates of papers in journals. And so if the journal says, well, Rodrigue, we're going to accept your paper if you cite four of our papers. That's dirty. OK? It's also common. So literature cited, this is probably beating a dead horse. But obviously, you know what I'm going to say. Be consistent. OK? It's almost universally full of errors. There are some very, very common ones. The one that almost everybody screws up is including the issue number for journals. You can include it. You can exclude it. Some journals require it. Some journals prohibit it. But if you're going to include it in one journal citation, you have to include it in L. Okay? Be consistent. 
So we can look at a literature cited section and you should be able to pick some things out right away. Look at that, there's the journal, but then look at this journal, italics or not. Here is a comma separating the volume and the pages, and here's a colon. Oops. Here's some little mess with hyphen and end dash. I don't see pages here. I don't see pages there. Uh-oh, capitalization in a title of a journal paper, and here, no caps. Okay, in fact, you know, downloadable, downloaded, uh, space between the initials or not, italics or not, comma after the journal or not, comma versus colon between volume and pages, that little mess, oops, abbreviation or not of the journal name, there's that caps problem, this is one that everybody misses, caps after colon in titles or not. So the obvious solution is EndNote, but it's not the solution, which is to say EndNote takes the data that are in here and puts them in a, cur a very consistent order and format. So it takes whatever's in the journal field and puts it here, whatever's in the volume field and puts it here. But if you have the wrong thing or the wrong content in one of those fields, so you should be able to see those two names are in all caps, Arambula and Aranda, but then these are in first letter cap, rest lowercase. And you can see there's some messy stuff here as well. So just saying, oh, I did it in EndNote, does not mean that your bibliography is correct. Because it's the garbage in, garbage <coughs> out principle. So really what you need to do, be it Zolotero, be it, I won't say Mendeley because they are in league with the devil, um, be it EndNote, you have to quality control the data, the bibliographic data going in, or you will have garbage coming out. And in fact, you can't even trust the journal pages. So you go to the journal page, you hit download citation, and you think, oh, it's got to be right. It came right from the journal. Except that different journals have different formats all caps of names, all caps of titles, this and that. My current system, as far as grabbing citations, to me the most consistent approach when I'm working is to grab the citation from Google Scholar, which under the reference has a little um, link that says cite, and that gives you, and then it can link to EndNote and BibText and a couple others. Um, but that gives you a fairly consistent, but not perfect, download of the citation. Talked about that. Okay, so now you have genuinely produced a complete, consistent, and well-written manuscript. And you kind of think, okay, I'm done. And you're not. Now we have to send it off to the journal. First thing you need to do is decide about cover letters. Sounds pretty simple. This is what I use essentially for everything. Please find attached to this letter a manuscript entitled whatever for consideration for publication in whatever. Very crucial, the manuscript is the intellectual product only of myself and my co-authors, basically saying I didn't take this from somebody, and my manuscript is not currently submitted for publication with any other journal. There are situations where <coughs> unscrupulous scientists will take the same manuscript, send it to five journals. Does happen. In okay. connection with the table and figure manuscripts, 
I'm often at a loss how much information I should put into uh, a caption.